Eh, sure. All right, before we jump into this video, I am going to be honest and let you know that I am completely exhausted. Uh, it's been a long day, but I told myself when I woke up that I was going to get this video done. So, we're going to power through this and we are going to get this video done. My name is Corey Bergeron, you are watching Corey Bergeron Recordings, and today this video is Ask Corey, episode number one. What is Ask Corey? Well, Ask Corey is simply a way for uh, the people that watch this the people that watch these videos to ask me questions and uh, I've been meaning to start a video series like this for a while because I think it cr it can create some interesting dialogue between the viewers and myself I asked a question in the Facebook audio production group that I created and uh, if you are not in it and you are watching this video go down to the link below and join the Facebook audio community in that group I asked this question to the members I said Okay, for real, let's start the Ask Corey video series. If anyone has any questions about production, being in a band, managing the studio, touring, gear, working with labels, general production philosophy, or whatever, ask me some questions down below and let's have some fun. And to my surprise, people actually replied. Uh, I realized that I'm completely at the mercy of the Facebook algorithm, so um, hopefully this doesn't fall flat on its face in the future. Anyways, you don't care about that. First question is from someone named Drew. I know who Drew is. I'm not gonna act like he's just somebody. Hi, Drew. Drew says, something that I need to learn. Which state should your songs be in before reaching out to engineers? Hello, Drew. Thank you for answering, asking. Thank you for asking that question. If you were to ask this specific question to multiple engineers, multiple producers, I'm sure they would all give you slightly different answers. So I will give you my answer, which uh, is from my own experience and it's kind of my opinion. When I'm working with a band, the first thing I ask them for, uh, before we even you know, book in studio time or anything, uh, to assure that I want to be working with this band is I ask them for demos. I want to hear what the band sounds like. I, I want to hear the music that I will be working on. And what I want to hear is the best production the band can make or the song as complete as the band can make it. Okay, I want them to have gone through, tried certain parts and you know, cut out the crap and made the songs as good as they possibly can. So when they bring it to me, the songs up here and I can use my experience to uh, cut the fat, add more of what's good, tell the vocalist that his melody sucks um, and you know, count for any arrangement issues that might come up, uh, make sure that we're on the same page and what kind of vibe or what kind of tones we want and uh, also tell them if the song's not great and that they should can it. Anyways, I like to hear the song as complete as the band can make it and if you are a band that doesn't have, uh, I guess, a great technical ability or you don't have a member in the band that has some sort of recording setup, that might mean that you have worked on the song, jamming it live with your bandmates in your jam spot, and the best thing you can do is an iPhone recording, and that's totally fine. That shows me uh, the song in the purest form, and that shows how you want it to translate, um, so there's tons of value in that. Now, on the contrary, if you have a member that is has a recording setup, has a technical uh, background or whatever, knows a little bit about recording, if they can lay down in a Pro Tools session or whatever, real drums, MIDI drums, uh, real bass, guitars, vocals, maybe even do some vocal arranging and having multiple parts, harmonies, uh, all that stuff. Basically, the best that they can do, that shows me how they intend to come into the studio and track and how they see the song coming across, and then I can be even more nitpicky with it as well as if you give me MIDI drums, I'm able to manipulate stuff before we're even in the same room. So anyways, long story short, I like to hear the song as complete as the band can make it. If a band comes in with a song that's at like 30%, we're gonna put in a lot of work just to get it up to 60%. If a band comes in with a song that's at 80%, uh, we're gonna put in a lot of work and get that up to you know 90 to 100 and uh, ultimately we're gonna create a better product because the band has done the work on their end to make the best product that they can. 
I think that makes sense. Hopefully that answers your question, Drew. Thank you for taking the time to ask. Let's move on. So question number two. This comes from JJ. JJ says, you always seem to achieve much greater success on your recordings with much less obsession with proper technique and gear than other producers, engineers, producers slash engineers. Just talk about that, because that is sick. And then he extends on this and says, example, when we track certain vocals and overdubs with interfaces some might deem unworthy or cheap, recording parts in your basement, etc. So, for full transparency, JJ is the drummer in my band, and he is probably talking about, or he is definitely talking about, um, some recording that we did back in February for an album that may or may not be made that I can't talk about. He didn't really ask a question here, but he gave me an excuse to talk about my recording philosophy. And there's a couple layers to this, so I'm gonna kind of break it down. When you are recording, the most, or there's, there's a hierarchy to everything. Things matter, and other things matter less. So, when I'm recording, what matters is that I have a great performer delivering a great performance. Ultimately, no matter what microphone I use in this studio to capture that, that will get me 80% there. Obviously, I want to use the most ideal everything uh, to capture that performance, but for whatever reason, you may not be able to do that. Whatever. So, the most important part is having a great performer giving a great performance. That will get you 80% of the way there. An extreme example of that would be if you record, or if I recorded myself singing a song with a U87, a Neve 1073 into a Distressor or whatever, some ideal vocal chain, ultimately we're recording, you know, we're using $10,000 worth of gear to record myself. And I'm not a great singer, I'm not a trained singer, so at the end of the day we're going to be left with a uh, less than ideal performance and that's no good. If someone's listening to that, or if someone, an average consumer is listening to that, they don't care what it was recorded with or frankly they don't care about the quality of the recording, they are not going to be able to connect with that and they'll probably be laughing because they're listening to me singing. I'm the source and that is the most important part of, uh, of the recording process. On the contrary, if you have someone like Freddie Mercury that has an incredible voice, incredible power, and is able to create a compelling performance, you can record him with, uh, I don't know, a rock band microphone, and it will translate to the consumer much better. It will communicate with them, it will be much more effective. The recording quality might be absolute crap, but it will ultimately be a more effective uh, recording. You get what I'm saying here. Extreme example, but you get what I'm saying here. Another thing, when I am in, actually let's let's talk about a very specific example. So, when we were working on this album that may, may or may not exist, that I can't talk about, uh, we tracked a lot of it in a recording studio, and we had to track some guitar parts and some vocal parts, and that was kind of like the last things we needed to do to finalize the recording of the record. So. They, the band had come to the city that I live in, and that's where we primarily worked on it. So it was only fair that to, to finish it off, I went to where they were. And uh, so I just, I, I rented a car, I threw a bunch of, I threw my basement studio into the car, and I drove to my bass player's house, and we set up a makeshift studio that was way less than ideal, but it was functional, in his basement. He was playing uh, Fortnite, uh, about five feet away from me, just to kind of paint a picture for you. And we were recording vocals in this like cement cellar <laughs> because that's all we had. I was using a Shure SM7B and I was using a Focusrite 2i2 uh, Scarlet, which is not ideal for a couple reasons. One, sure, you could argue it's not the best preamp in the world and sure, whatever. Uh, you could argue that it may not be the most applicable microphone because for the rest of the record we were using a Neumann TLM 103. Um, but it's what we had and we made it work. Uh, what is most important is the performance and we recorded some of the most intimate parts of the album with that setup and they totally translate now from a technical point of view the preamps on the focus right uh, once you get past like three quarters they start to introduce some like hiss some noise and the Shure SM7B has a very low output um, a really low SPL output 
Yeah, anyways, so you need a lot of preamp juice to get uh, an appropriate level out of the Shure SM7B microphone, and when you're recording really delicate parts, it is not an ideal situation. So in post, as I am uh, EQing it, compressing it, whatever, I'm noticing that there's a little bit of noise in it. But it's not the end of the world because the performance still kicks ass. Um, yeah, so that's that. And then the last, I guess, angle to kind of tie into this whole thing is the more experienced you become, the more familiar you are with your uh, surroundings and how your speakers sound, the more you're able to stop worrying about proper technique or, you know, if I'm micing something up looks weird and just kind of listen to it and if it sounds right, it is right. Um, if I'm hearing something that I know I can't fix in post or, hmm, I shouldn't say that. If, if I'm hearing something that I know yeah, I guess I can't fix and post, um, then I will address it. And when I mean fix and post, I might mean like doing 3 dB of uh, EQ, getting rid of some low mid on a vocal performance because I don't actually have an EQ, excuse me, on hand. Um, but yeah, I think that about sums it up. I've, I know a bunch of engineers and some of their philosophies are, are different than mine and that's totally fine. Um, and they care about things that I might deem almost negligible or much less important to the process and that is totally cool that is their way of doing it but I like to primarily focus on what makes the biggest difference and then go from there obviously in a perfect situation I want to have the best gear the best performance the best everything but sometimes uh, you're in a less than ideal situation you got to make do with what you have and you can still create great results with it boom there's my answer for you JJ and lastly, let's, uh, or lastly, number three, we've got, uh, we've got a third question here. So this one is from my friend, Paul St. John. Paul asks, how to balance guitar, bass, kick, low end to get that nasty chunk without just having your mix being a boomy mess? Paul, thank you for asking the question. Now, Paul, I know you personally, and I know that you work or that you play in a metal band. Um, and you listen to aggressive metal music. But even if I didn't know that, the way you word your question by saying to get that nasty chunk totally gives away the fact that you are talking about a, an aggressive uh, metal or hardcore style of production. So, to answer your question, when it comes to balancing your bass drum, your bass guitar, and your guitars to get an effective low end without it being boomy, the first step is a an appropriate performance. So uh, if you're recording, let's say a metal song and it's, let's say it's like super balls to the wall, it's all out aggression, your kick drum is gonna be, or you're gonna want that your kick drum is performed at a similar velocity all the way through. You wanna have a consistent performance. That will naturally let it sit in the mix uh, before you even touch anything, okay? Now let's move on to the bass, same thing. A great bass player uh, has complete control of their dynamics and if you are recording a balls to the wall metal song you want to make sure that the picking hand is very consistent when you're recording it um, because there's only so much fixing you can do before you tear all your hair out and just replace the drummer with, or sorry the bass player with a MIDI bass player um, and no one wants to do that maybe some people want it. I don't want to do that anyways so you have to assure you got to maybe take it part by part you got maybe note by note to assure that you have a consistent bass performance and uh, that it's played consistently. So now you have your kick drum that's played consistently, you have your bass drum that's played consistently, and the same thing applies to the guitars that I just mentioned about the bass. So boom, now you have a uh, an appropriate performance to give you the desired sound that you're going for. The next thing is deciding what is going to, or yeah, what is gonna sit where. So I like to have my kick drum sit lowest in the mix. So I usually get that sitting around, um, the fundamental frequency is around like 60 Hertz. And that's usually where the kick drum sits. And then on top of that, I have the bass guitar. So I might roll off some of the low to let that kick drum through naturally. Cause if you get them on top of each other, that's where you're gonna start to get boomy. That's where it's gonna get muddy. That's where it's gonna start to get messy. Your mix is not gonna have the punch. When you're compressing your mix, it's not gonna have the kick drum to like uh, catch with or catch onto and uh, compress it. Anyways, so 
you have to define where things are going to sit. So I like to have my kick drum at 60 hertz and then my bass guitar 80, 100, whatever. Um, once you get those two sitting appropriately, your mix, your guitars will sit on that, your vocals will sit in the middle, everything will sit on that and then you will start to get that sound that you're going for and that you're familiar with with all these commercial metal records that you listen to. Something that is uh, very, very commonly used and I know when I started doing it kind of gave me the sound that I was looking for is when you are processing bass in post after you've already nailed a great consistent bass performance don't be afraid of limiting the shit out of the low end on the bass guitar. If you do a split bass technique, meaning that you split up, um, you duplicate your track, you split one track to be just the high end of the bass guitar and one track to be just the low end of the bass guitar, um, it's a very common practice used among uh, metal engineers. You can isolate that low end on that low end track and just compress it and then limit the hell out of it. Don't be afraid to do that. That will really clamp down on it and make it kind of sit where it needs to go. And then that will help add the consistency and it'll make it punchy uh, and not necessarily boomy. And then the last little tip on this that I'll give you is to take a mix, throw it into your session, a mix that you like. Take a, take a mix that you think has like a phenomenal low end, okay? Throw that into your session, take an EQ, make a high cut or a low pass filter and just bring it all the way down to like 100 hertz, okay? So now you're only gonna be monitoring, you're only gonna be listening to the low end and basically the sub of the mix. Um, some low mid and the sub. Listen to how that, uh, how it, the bass drum and the bass guitar are sitting together and then do the same thing to your mix. Listen to your mix and see well, basically, yeah, just see what see what you're listening to. Is your kick drum really inconsistent? Is your bass guitar really inconsistent? Are they performed consistently, but they're overlapping? Like it's it's you don't have a clear kick drum punch in the low end or in the sub every time it hits. It's kind of just muddy and all mangled together. Anyways, you get my point. Try and isolate uh, a mix. Listen to the low end. Listen to the sub, and then compare it to yours and try and get them similar and then once you get your low end right in your mix everything else will fall right on top of that your guitars will fall right on top of that and that is that so hopefully that gives you a little bit of guidance as to uh what to do to balance your guitar bass and kick low end to get that nasty chunk without just having a mix being a boomy mess so there we go i just answered three questions hopefully there's some sort of value in any of those um I want to keep creating videos in this video series, ask Corey, I'm about to fall asleep. But if you made it to the end of the video, thank you so much. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. I have some really, really cool projects that I'm going to be starting um, and probably releasing at the start or mid-September. Maybe. We'll see. Don't hold me accountable to it. But there's going to be a new video series that I'm not going to talk too much about, but I think it's going to be really cool and I'm really stoked to start creating it and it's going to give you an inside light, an inside look on what I actually do here in the studio when I'm working with a band. Okay, that's all I'm going to give you. Anyways, if you would like to see that, make sure to subscribe, to stick around, turn on those notifications, dude. Um, join the Facebook group if you haven't. I'm going to make another post eventually when I want to make a... Uh, ask Corey number two so be sure to be in the Facebook group to ask any questions that you may or if yeah that you may have and hit that like button and the other things share it with your family and I will see you in the next video thank you so much for watching Bye.